Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson, joined by Brian Gottlieb. And since we're in a little bit of a downturn, uh, not a whole lot going on magic-wise, and the fact that this person is going to be very busy very, very soon, uh, we have a very special guest in Emma Handy. Long overdue appearance on the episode, I think. Long overdue is being a bit generous, but I appreciate y'all having me on either way. From my side, I feel like it's long overdue, and I think Brian would agree too. Yeah, I don't know why we never quite synced up our schedules. We talked a bit leading up to this episode how uh, all of our anxieties prevent us from asking you, you from asking to come on, and then we end up not doing something we all really want to do for some reason. But I'm glad we are all on the same page now, and we're getting we're getting to do this episode before you before you leave us, Emma, and depart and go work at Wizards of the Coast. Look. It's exciting, but I'm just glad to be here. I'm glad we were able to get it in. It's something that, uh, I don't know, I've been a long-time listener of the podcast, and it's helped me get back into back into competitive magic when I wasn't really feeling like doing it for the most part. So, I don't know, I don't want to call it, I don't want to be melodramatic and call it a bucket list thing, or a magic bucket list thing, but it's it's really, really cool to be here. Well, yeah, it is, it is cool to have you. Uh, you are... Easily one of my favorite people in the community and over like the last five years or so, you've just like risen consistently to be like a stalwart in the magic community. You have a bunch of very solid takes. You say a lot of very smart things. We try and do the same thing on the podcast. So I feel like it, you know, just makes sense for you to be here anyway. I appreciate that. Anyway, uh, when, when do you start? by the way, at Wizards? Uh, Day one for me is January 4th. Okay, so so coming up quick, is there anything that you're doing between now and then? Is like, how much content do you have left to do for Star City, for example? I know I have at least one more article, which uh, is a little awkward because I keep just wanting to rewrite the Gavin Verhey farewell article. And that's obviously not it. But other than that, I'm thinking I, I want to get at least a couple more streams in because uh, that's at least going to take a a hiatus, if not going away indefinitely once I go over to Renton. But other than that, I don't think there's a lot. I had um, I had a medical thing recently that makes it hard to really throw as much of myself as I'm used to into magic content. So that's a little bit of a hurdle, but I'm hoping to knock out at least one more good article and a few more streams before then. Was this like the goal the entire time or was this just kind of something that happened? Oh, I kind of fell into it. (laughs) (laughs) We'll We'll take those. Yeah. I'm, I'm blessed to be around enough smart people who kind of think of things in in ways that I think a lot of designers do in general in terms of turning knobs on cards or something being a cool design or a fun design or placing a smart bet to piggy pack on uh, one of P. Sully's big, big phrases. So I I don't know. I, I think I'm lucky in a lot of regards to have made it here, but it was not necessarily an end goal in anything other than something that you know, 14 year old me scrawling in a notebook thought, wow, it'd be so cool to make super black Lotus or whatever. <laughs> Commander black Lotus, maybe. Ooh. <laughs> Is that, I feel, I feel like that's close enough to, to starting a Twitter fire that maybe, maybe that's not the one. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So we are going to talk about how to consume and make content and, Obviously, it's going to be in like under the lens of magic specifically, right? But I feel like this is applicable to a lot of different things on the internet. And I have a mostly written article on this that I never quite posted. Brian and I have talked about doing this episode for some time. And I feel like this is a thing that you're uniquely suited to talk about, Emma. Go on. <laughs> well, uh <laughs> It's your show. You got to introduce it. I can't. I can't I, be the one to. I can't bury the lead. You know. Word. No. I mean, there is a lot of content out there, and how do you figure out like whose advice you actually want to follow? What articles you're actually clicking on? How do you figure out what brings value to you? And as someone who 
I think probably consumes a lot of magic content and certainly has, you know, made a name for herself creating content in a lot of different forms that you know what's up. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think one of the most important things is kind of figuring out what you actually want to and what purpose for what purpose you're engaging with content in general, right? Like, why are you actually consuming whatever you're actually consuming, right? Are you trying to get better at magic? Do you want to know what the best deck box on the market is? Do you just want to see a video of someone doing some absurd planar chaos bulk rare combo or like what what are you actually trying to get out of the content you're consuming and do you think that people necessarily know the answer to that question because no. i feel like yeah okay i don't do think they even do they even think it. about it yeah no that exactly brian yeah that's i i think a lot of people kind of just go oh yeah i mean paul is the best magic player of all time. Why, why wouldn't I read Paulo's articles when it isn't necessarily things that are going to apply to what they want to get out of magic? You know, maybe they're more into the cosplay scene or something like that, but this is, this is the world champion who is debatably the best of all time. Why, why wouldn't I read their stuff when they're not actually going to get anything that they would like out of it? So as Someone who is, you know, opening their browser or whatever, looking for, you know, they like magic. They want to click on something magic related. What should they do as far as, you know, just following inertia or actually seeking out things that would help them? So I think the first step is basically trying to find people who have similar goals to what you do. Right. In a lot of cases, you might be on to piggyback on the previous example you might not be remotely on the level that Paulo is on, right? But you can still recognize that you, if you both want to get better at the game, be the best in the world, play at the highest level, beat the best players, etc., and know that this person is writing with the same goals in mind that you are reading with. Or if you want to, say, find the best product or something like that, that's something that... Tillyering Community College makes a ton of content for. I hope this all doesn't sound super shilly for specific people. These are just large examples in the community for certain ideas. But I, I think a lot of, for a lot of people, kind of identifying what it is you actually want out of the game and then finding other people with similar interests that produce the things that you want is a really, really good starting point that a lot of people don't consciously reach for. Well, so then say that there's, you know, someone like Paulo and then maybe, I don't know, someone like me or someone who's like a, a PTQ grinder, like playing in the same stuff that the consumer is playing in. Like, how do you figure out which thing to click on or like who to trust? Right. You know, like Paulo says, play this deck and other person says, play this other deck. That's one of the hard things, right? Because no one's right every single week. There's one of the people that I actually consume a ton of their content, and ooh, I can say friend of the podcast, uh, Yo Man. Uh, I love Yo Man's metagame analysis. Yeah, we're all we're all friends here. Name drop away. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I love Yo Man's uh, metagame analysis. My the, my first pro level event, I actually just ended up playing. I think a little under 70 of Yo Man 75 from the week before because I thought it was a really good call but was a week early. Anyway, uh, to answer your question, I, th I think a lot of it kind of comes down to what information you're looking for and kind of just tr as you play, you're going to figure out for yourself what you actually value and what you're actually going to end up believing whenever you're consuming somebody's content, right? There's a level where you can kind of see is this person just writing something because they need to write it or how informed does what they're saying actually sound and then extrapolate from there. Yeah. And that might change like based on the, the content creator on any given time. Right. It's like, certainly there, there's a large group of people, you know, for us folks writing articles every week. Right. It's like, we, we kind of have to do it every week and there are going to be some weeks where our information is like more important or our confidence interval is higher than any other week. Right. So there, there are some weeks where, you know, Paulo is going to be definitely right. And there's some weeks where maybe he's going to be wrong. Right. I, I think that a lot of the better self-aware writers are the kind of people who 
they're going to write an article every week, right? You know, paychecks a paycheck to be kind of ugly about it or nitty gritty about it maybe. But a lot of times whenever you have someone who plays, has a wide range or builds a lot of decks or something like that says, Hey, this is the deck to be playing. And they're someone who is respectable or generally has good opinions in the magic community. That that's a point where you should sort of perk up and listen. I, uh, think uh, an example a few years ago is when uh, I think it was Sam Black who brought the Death Shadow deck to y'all's attention and was like, hey, I know this looks kind of goofy, but seriously, this deck is messed up. Y'all should play it. And then, what, four out of five of you top eight of the GP or something? Yes, something like that. I, I think uh, like Severa and Ochoa didn't. So maybe it was like three out of five or something. But yeah, that was that was one instance where, you know, for from, from my perspective, working with Sam a lot, He's normally like on the sidelines doing his own thing, like putting anointed percentage in all of his decks or whatever. And he'll say like, if you want to work on this, cool, but this is not something that you should play at the Pro Tour. Like, I'm just going to do my thing. And this is the one instance where he was like, no, this is all busted. You should play it. And that made us all sit up and take notice because he doesn't say that lightly. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the kind of thing to be looking for whenever you're just looking for whatever the final answer is, right? And I think... Even with content, a lot of people aren't just necessarily looking for that final answer. There certainly is the level of people who just kind of want to have the deck to play in the sideboard guide for FNM because they just want to go sling some cardboard. And I think that's perfectly respectable. That kind of circles back around to the know your engagement, know where you want to be. And if you just want to hang out and play cards, that's perfectly fine. But if you're trying to get better, I think a lot of the time there is a level where looking at people who are kind of on top of things at the moment and seeing what they have to say about the decisions that they're making is something that can lead to a lot of personal level up moments just by drawing parallels from the things they say. That's something that is probably the biggest thing that has gotten me to where I am today is just looking at things that people have said about certain formats or certain archetypes and then finding the ways that I can apply those to my decks today or a format today. I think one of the interesting points is that where the goal is, if your goal as a consumer of magic content is improvement, then a huge portion of that is actually building relationships with writers. And I don't mean like knowing the writer personally. I mean, understanding how the writer operates, understanding how they deliver information to you and understand what degree of confidence they use before they share something. Because we've talked a lot here. We both think there's value, me more than Jerry, but we both think there's value in sharing sketches and going through thought processes and sharing the early work that is going to eventually lead us to the conclusions that will be, yes, it's time to play this deck. But we talked about the power of the retweet too, where someone just retweets a deck list and sees it with no context. And it's like, Oh, well, this person said this deck is here. It must be good. Play it. And they get wrecked. And I think you've fallen victim to that with some of my deck lists before Emma, uh, <laughs> a, a rogues list or two nice, pops to uh, mind. I was going to say nice Rakdos rogues list, buddy. Right. Right. So, uh, but once you've established a relationship, I'll use myself as an example. If you've established, established a relationship with my content, I will share that stuff. But when I say it's go time, this is the deck to play. Like most recently I did that in our discord with Celestia Urian when that deck was really good. And I was like, look, this isn't, this isn't a drill. This one's real time to go. And a bunch of people picked it up and did well with it. But, but if, unless you had that relationship with me, you wouldn't know that this was the thing to pay attention to. And I think when I was starting out in magic, I really struggled with this because During this era, this is like 2009, 2010, when I was really getting interested in the competitive scene, I think bombastic claims were even more the mode of giving out information. And it wasn't done as much tongue in cheek. Like now we'll say this deck is broken and it's just kind of a meme. But back then, people believed it and said it a lot. And you were tricked into playing a lot of really stupid things by a lot of the more bombastic and present content creators. And it really hurt my growth for a long time, just handicapping myself, believing that this person must know something that I don't. And I'm just playing the deck poorly. And that's why I'm not doing good. And then in retrospect, it's like, no, this deck was just kind of garbage. And it was sold to me as something it wasn't. So without those relationships in place, you can really do harm, I think, to your progress as a player. 
Yeah, I can agree with that. I think there's also a level of recognizing that you, that this all kind of circles around who's recognizing when to actually take something that a content creator says is actionable, which is really hard. Yeah. I think it's something where we're trained that we want to always write or never want to write in the passive voice, right? So saying that you're unsure about something just looks like bad writing. But at the same time, you still want to write about things that you might not necessarily be sure about and you want to be a good writer and you want people to think you're a good writer so they continue consuming what you do. And it can lead to those sort of situations where you put out a Mardu rogue stack <laughs> and make it sound like a, a, a better deck than it actually is because you end up priced into these scenarios where that's the way that you actually get the message out, so to speak. Yeah, I try to find other things to be excited rather than just like, this is the best deck of all time. Like, I want to be excited about, you know, playing something that is not Sultai or Sacrifice in Historic or something. So I'm like, yo, this isn't tier one, but if you want to play a tier two deck, like, this is something that's cool and fun and competitive and like try and hype that aspect up. And I don't think that that's necessarily a negative because... You know, a, a lot of people are attracted to things that are not just, you know, the the stock or road deck or whatever. Yeah, I can agree with that. I think there's a point where it kind of comes down to, I mean, it's just everything is going to circle back around to what you actually want to get out of content, right? Right. And I think that, I mean, there's 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 a lot of magic content now, right? And it's catering towards all different levels of players. And I think that, you know, for the most part, that's a good thing. Like back in my day, I guess, like, you know, 2005 to 2010, it was mostly just catered to like PTQ level players. And it was, it would, it would be just like, you know, my fires or my Euro part 30, you know, and now we have a wider variety of content and, there's, there's certainly a lot of players who don't necessarily want to just play the best deck or like they are priced out of playing the best deck. Yeah, and I even feel like there are a lot of kinds of content today that weren't necessarily the same kind of content that they were 10 years ago, right? There, I, I go back and watch a lot of tournament replays for the sake of mostly looking at how people sequence and sideboard, specifically people that I think are better than me. Like, I'll watch how Paulo sideboards in a matchup on the play versus the draw, because on Arena, you can just pause the video and see what the configuration is yeah. and get a ton of information just from watching people be unsure about things, where you'll see someone click cards in and out of their deck, but it'll be a card where they go, ah, do I want three of this card? Do I want two of this card? Uh, I guess I'll cut all of them. That kind of gives you an idea that this person's thought process thought that the card has some play, but it actually isn't worth it on the draw or what have you. But back in the day, that just isn't something that would have been possible, right? I, I linked a an old thing from, I think it was Pro Tour. It, it doesn't matter. Pro Tour something 2006 in my article today. It is almost unwatchable. That, that might just, be generous. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's just not something people are going to go back and consume a lot of the time. And it's it's not like anyone did anything wrong back then. It's more just that content in general and like, as a medium has made so many great, great strides to be a much higher quality than it used to be. You can learn a lot about a person by like the last card that they cut. Honestly, I think you can just learn a lot about a person by seeing how much they trim versus how much they cut. Yeah. That's maybe like my, uh, my, my, my toxic trait as a magic player <laughs> is uh, if I'm watching someone sideboard, I'm covering a match and I see them just trim one copy of like five cards. I immediately, this is, you know, some real behind the scenes stuff. I'm immediately just like, ah, haven't played this one much. Have we? Yeah. No, I, I do the same thing. It's hard not to, but I, when we were, when we were covering the Red Bull thing, I, I, I think I made a point to, you know, talk about watching people sideboarding and how important that is and like what you can figure out, like what's going through their mind, especially in that moment, you know, and that's that's content that exists that you can consume that isn't, you know, on on like the big websites. Right. Like there is content out there that 
isn't even stuff that you would think to be consumable as content. It feels weird to call Twitch not one of the big websites. Well, I, I just mean as far as like, <laughs> you know, getting getting articles and whatnot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it is just something where it is just, it feels different because it isn't a specific individual content creator that is going, hey, check out my article or check out my video series on yada yada, or you getting right. a, a ping on your phone that someone is going live or that someone posted a video or what have you. It just is an archive that you can go back and look at. Like I know I learned a lot, a lot when playing Just Guy Fires earlier this year by just going, all right, I know the lists aren't the same anymore, but how did Paulo side against Jund Food when Canister was playing that at MC7. All right, how did Monty Davuti sideboard with this against Blue White Control and against uh, Teamer Adventures at uh, the Anaheim Dreamhack and so on? Just going back, watching the tape on even double speed or something to try and just get to the parts I cared about faster. It just shows how how active your content consumption is. Like for you getting the information isn't just something that you expect to be handed and spoon fed. You, you are actively creating opportunities to learn. And I think that's a really good lesson to take away is that like, if you have the desire for growth, it's not only about checking the boxes and reading what everyone says, but it's looking between the lines too and figuring out why there's differing perspectives. Why this person is saying this, why this person is saying the opposite, why these decisions are being made and these small, subtle things like adjustment of sideboards and taking one card first and then putting it back, they all matter. And part of being a good content consumer is recognizing every opportunity you, you have to grow. Yeah, and I think there's a point where a lot of that comes from recognizing that everybody else just is a living, breathing, thinking human and if some people have used that living, breathing, and thinking to become successful, there's probably something to be gained from that, right? Or at least from the outside. There's something you can probably take away from whatever method they used. You know, obviously there's a point where the cards just come up right for some people. But, like, how many times can the cards just come up right for some people without them doing something to line them up that way? Right. See, now I'm, I'm disappointed that you're going to work for wizards because I would tell you to produce like your content viewing habits and things that you learned into a piece of content. I, I'm trying to think, I feel like I did an article about it, but I might be wrong. I'm probably wrong. I don't know. It'd be really hard. I, uh, so on top of me being privileged enough to have a three monitor set up, I also don't know if mo like the way that I normally when I am in full on PT testing mode or what have you, I generally will have um, arena on my center screen, have multi twitch with two or three streams up on another stream and then be scouring deck lists on the third screen. Love it. And it's something where during my opponent's turns, I'm frequently consuming something else because I don't think I have to explain too much. If you watch people who grind a ton of online magic, you just take game actions much faster than your opponents and staring at them flick between the Uro in their graveyard or the card in their hand is just feels like you're wasting time. Yeah, that's that's why we had this whole thing last week about me needing to play Arena from my couch because I can't just do it like staring at a laptop screen and then just waiting for my opponent to take a game action because it takes too long. Yep. Yep. I, and, I, and some of it's hard, right? Like I don't, um, I don't have all the audio on from all the different streams that I'll be watching, but there is a point and it's worth noting. It's not just the same streams every time I'm, I obviously have some streams that I like to watch the most for, for entertainment value, for example, like I really like just lurking in Amazonian stream, but a lot of times whenever I'm trying to learn for an event, finding other people who are also learning for that event and playing different decks is something where you can kind of just be playing a game and watch someone play blue white control and watch that list of blue white control get absolutely creamed by soul tie or goblins or whatever the thing is and say, all right, well, that makes me less interested in playing that version of blue white control. And that doesn't, right. you don't have to be actively engaged to learn that you can just 
ha- see what their necklace is at some point, vaguely try and remember what the the what they're doing to season to taste with it, and then watch them get creamed by Anissa and know that you don't want to have those same seasonings because Nissa is something that's big and historic or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's also valuable to watch someone else's preparation and watch how their necklace evolves, right? Because if, you know, in the Azorius control example for for historic, like if their deck list, you know, continues to add like more and more main deck Aether Gusts or something like that, it's like that is something that is probably going to trend for that tournament, you know, because a lot of other people are going to go through the same process. You just kind of get to see that happening live. Oh yeah, that's something I did for uh, Barcelona last year was um, I put a lot of threads up during my draft prep and was just like, hey, what do y'all take here? What do y'all take here? And so on, because I wanted to see what other people who were going to be playing at the tournament thought. And people just chiming in and being like, oh yeah, Sling Gang was just like, I can't believe you got it third. You have to take Sling Gang Commander here. I'm just like, okay. So if I get it fifth in Barcelona, that is a loud signal. Thank you for the free information. I appreciate you. Yeah, and and it's not always that insidious. A lot of the times I am genuinely asking advice, but it's more to say that there are a ton of levels to every question you ask or even every bit of information that you gain from somebody. Yeah. Well, on the making content side of things, I feel like you're going to have a lot to talk about because like I said, I mean, your, your, your content game is very strong, Emma. And thank you. Thank you. And like I said, I, I started writing this sort of article because I feel like people uh, a lot of the time start making content because it, it's fun, right? It's something that they want to do. They want to participate in the community and all that stuff. And a lot of time, you know, people just kind of enter into it without a plan. And I think that that's good. I think the best way that you should, you know, get into making content is to just start producing things, maybe without a plan. But I think that there are a lot of ways to, you know, make your content better for you, for your readers, for the community as a whole, if, you know, you you actually know what you're trying to accomplish, right? Yeah, so I I think one of the the most important things I tell to anyone who goes, hey, I'm thinking about writing articles or streaming or whatever it is, the thing I always tell that person is make sure that it's something you would be happy if you did it in an empty room. That's just, you need to make sure that you're actually making content that you would not hate making because for anyone starting off, you are basically just, streaming to nobody or writing to nobody, unless you have a bunch of accolades or something like that. That's largely a different conversation. Right. So I I think it's important to not go in with some, all right, I'm going to be having hundred viewer streams in two or three months or something, and then get burned out whenever they don't hit those sorts of um, results oriented goals. I know that is a thing that gets thrown around a lot when talking about grinding and magic but I think it also has a lot of applications in just every facet of life, really. But not all of those things are always in your control. And I think you just need to make sure that you're kind of tempering your expectations because that is one of the only things in content creation that is in your control outside of the content itself, obviously. I know this is everything I say is going to be through the lenses of survivorship bias. <laughs> of course. But um, I know I got my start writing magic articles on Tumblr with just hashtagging it to a bunch of different things and basically got no interaction, but it let me practice how I wanted to write out a deck guide because I liked writing out deck guides and justifying all my silly card choices or what have you. And then that went up to a blog and so on. And a lot of that did just kind of come from, hey, I'm going to make content that I think is good because I like to make it. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't didn't know that. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. And it's something like we've never discussed here on the show before. But like this, the start that we all had in content creation is strange. I think we we all came at it from different angles and hearing your story. Like, why was it Tumblr that that drew you to it? Was it just a platform you were already engaged with? And you didn't really know how else to get your voice out there? Or because I, I don't think I've ever heard that startup story for anyone before. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so this is 
2014, I think, was the first time I did it. Maybe 2013. But, uh, a lo okay, so first of all, Tumblr originally was pitched as, like, a blogging website, right? So it was, it, it felt at the time, to me, much closer to putting articles on WordPress okay. or something like that and then putting them on a social media website. It's like Tumblr was the halfway point between Twitter and WordPress was at least my my experience to to the website. Maybe Twitter's a bad example. I think DeviantArt would be closer. But anyway, a, lo a lot of it just came down to understanding how hashtagging worked on there because that's how I found content. And basically going, okay, so if I just write out how I sideboard or why I play the cards that I do in this Mardu Aristocrats deck and then hashtag it with MTG and Magic and Magic the Gathering and Cons of Tarkir, then maybe some people surfing the thing will actually want to try this deck out and they might reblog it or whatever. And if not, it's pretty easy to delete and it's easier to kind of write those things to myself and then try to build up, I guess, a portfolio, for lack of a better term. If I ever want to approach somebody about seriously trying to write for their website, I can point to things like, hey, I put a blog out on my Tumblr every Tuesday for the last couple of months so I can stick to a schedule and I can put out a thousand words of standard content a week. If you want, I would love to write for your website. Whereas easier to do that than just go up to whatever editor for what whichever website it is and say, hey, I want to write magic without anything to show for it or any proof that I can actually do it. Right. And I think having a portfolio is definitely important. It makes things easier, but it's like also just good for the person. Like you said, I mean, you get the practice of doing that. You figure out what works for you, what kind of content you want to create, and you just get to kind of hone your craft from there. Now I'm into this idea of sharing origin stories. And I want to know your origin story too, Jerry. Where, where did you first write? So I could say Star City in, in 2008, but I wrote for TCG Player for a little bit. And I, I th things are just way different now because like the websites back then basically only hired, you know, like platinum pros because who, who the hell else would you listen to? You know, you're not really going to listen to some PTQ grinder on like Star City Premium. So by the time I started writing, I was already mostly established. And then it kind of happened how Emma talked about before, where just like, you know, if you're if you're established, people are just like, yeah, sure, like I'll I'll see what you got. You know, it's not like I have no idea who you are. You need to prove that like you're competent, that you can write, that you can write on a consistent consistent schedule and stuff like that. And then I mean, even aside from like the TCG player stuff, when I started for, for Star City, it was mostly me just participating in their forums of the articles that people wrote where, I don't know, like Chapin is the only person I can think of who was like writing back then where it's like, you know, he would say something that I thought was wrong and then I would just try and like blast him on the forums about it or whatever. And... <laughs> I, I wasn't like that bad about it. You no, know, I, would like I mean, to, I, that was pretty common for the 2000s. Is all yeah, the different it, websites had some sort of forum where you could just be like, honestly, I can't believe you walk outside and tell people to put 22 lands <laughs> in their red deck. Yeah, but but like I was also, you know, trying to have a discussion too because I did care about learning and it was more like, you know, I want to know what the thought process was that, that got you here. And... Uh, at some point I met Chapin and then, you know, consistent talking about like decks with people who I was like now friends with that played on pro tours and stuff. And Chapin interviewed me for some article, which was basically me writing the article for him. Uh, and then after that, you know, he, he, he just like sort of pressured me to like start writing, you know, in a good way, you know, he was just like, this would be good for you. You could use the money. Like, obviously you care about you know, helping people and informing people and like, you're, you're good at providing information. And I was super nervous about it because I was like, I'm, I'm not a writer, you know, like I can, can barely play magic. Why, why would I want to write about this? Why would anyone want to listen to me? And it was, it was pretty easy to do once I started doing it. And I did really like it. 
Do you know that my magic origin story also comes through Chapin? I did not know that. I, yeah. I, so Chapin has his hands in a lot of things. Yeah. So it's not super surprising, I guess. But my mine was a little different in that I remember this is probably 2010. Star City was doing like uh, find new writers type deal. It was almost like a competition, uh, and I think it was like Ted Newton was the editor at the time, and him and Chapin were doing basically like a contest to find new writers. Yeah. And I submitted something to it for whatever reason. I was just like playing a bunch of magic at that time and started to think about maybe writing something and uh, was rejected. But Chapin took the time to say, I think you were really close. And I think maybe you just chose the wrong topic here. And if you wrote something else, it would be quite good and you should keep doing it. And at that point, I reached out to... Uh, Trick Jarrett, who now works at Wizards, but back then ran a magic website, which I think was like Gathering Magic yep. then. Gathering Magic then, cool Is that stuff right? like now. Yep. Yeah. That was and, my first uh, paid gig. Yeah, it, it was also my first paid gig. I, <laughs> nice. I just messaged him and I was like, can I can I write an article for you? And uh, said yes for some reason. I can't even tell you why. Like I didn't I didn't have any results or anything, but I I he let me write and it worked out from there and I only did it occasionally until uh ended up with the current gig but I, I think you can resist this characterization if I have it wrong Emma but I think you and I have a lot of parallels in our content creation world because I think we both built our reputation more on content than results which is oh, yeah. a, a rarity like that do, that doesn't really happen in the magic space it's it's hard to get people to take you seriously if you're not pointing to oh i have this many pro tour top eights and i have this many gp top eights but like i've said about you from the first time i watched you play it was obvious that like you were just waiting on a break. And there's so many people out there in the magic world who may never get that break, but still have so much to contribute. And I think the road is a lot harder, but like you are proof that you can build reputation through just putting yourself out there and having great ideas and trusting people to recognize that even if you don't have that pedigree, good ideas will float to the top. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly a point where I I mean, what you said about building through content creation rather than through pro results, I, I think that largely applies to um, competitive spheres. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's an important caveat to add because I think that a lot of the largest content creators have nothing to do with whatever we call the PT today. Right. Right. Like we have like YouTube is just the, the numbers they do over there just like blow most everything else out of the water. For the most part, Crokies doesn't really deal with things in that scene and so on. But um, that being said, I, I, I do agree. I, I think that kind of being able to just create content that is good and is provides people with actionable things to up their own game is, is a lot of what got us to where we are today. So when w once you were like established, you're like, you know, you got this nice cushy star city writing gig did did you have a plan for like what kind of content you were trying to create oh uh, so when you say nice cushy star city <laughs> writing gig <laughs> that was in uh, quotes by the way right i <laughs> so even without the quotes are you referring to when I just had a got a job writing for SCG or it's not a job when I secured a contract writing articles for right. SCG or at the point when that converted to premium or basically in the beginning, it's just like you, you have now landed on, on one of the big websites and presumably you would expect for that job to, to go for a while. Right. Sure. So you you know that you have a, a future in this, however long you want to stick it out or whatever. And like, you know, what are you trying to do now that you're there? That's a complicated one because at this point, so pretty early on, I started writing because I felt like I had things to say or I had things to teach people that the magic community largely wasn't aware of. Uh, I think I've taught most of the things that I have to say. I'm, I'm learning more and, you know, pick up on new things to say, you know, knock on wood, praise the Lord, etc. 
But I, I think the the goals of my writing have largely shifted since I started writing to where it is much closer to a job for me now than a passion project. Like originally it was something where I would go to work, work a 10 hour shift, come home, stay up till three or four in the morning writing my magic article because I was so excited to put these ideas down on paper or whatever. And now it's like, all right, well, the thing that I do for 10 hours on Tuesday every week is come up with 2,000 words worth of content. I know that my uh, catalog doesn't come even hold a candle to the number of articles that you've written, Jerry, but I, I'm pushing like half a million words or something at this point of magic content. And there comes a point where it is really hard to not trip over yourself and write about things that you've already said. And unfortunately I take a little bit of pride in the things that I do and don't really want to just write the article that I wrote two years ago, but with a different standard format, you know? Yeah, no, I, I get that completely. But I also think it's worth noting that the reader base that you have now is likely very different than the reader base you had two years ago, or, uh, you know, they've, they've simply forgotten that lesson, you know? To a point, I, I think that a lot of the trends in magic have also shifted, right? There's a point where, I don't know if it's my favorite magic art article I've ever written. It was for a long time, though, was just a straight up theory article that I thought was very good. And I put a lot of time into it and I had ended up getting like a third of my usual viewership because I think that it just isn't the kind of thing that a lot of people are as interested in anymore, which is fine, right? Like ultimately there's a point where it's it, it, to relate it to music. It comes down to if you want to want to write 20 minute epics or if you want to crank out singles, people are going to like the singles more and that's okay. But to a point, the, the job is writing single or making singles. Yeah, I'm I'm doing a theory piece next week, so I'm very excited to have half the the normal readership that I have. <laughs> it's going to be my great. theory piece this week involved Queen's Gambit, so I'm hoping I'm hoping the clickbaity title got some people in the door. Yeah, that might have been too meta. I don't know. Maybe that's ugly to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think so. See, like that's the thing though is we know that the theory articles are potentially more helpful than anything else that you're going to read, right? Go on. So why would you not want to like clickbait slash trick people into clicking on the article? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. That's a fair point. That's, that's like a reasonable framing for that, I guess. More, yeah. I, I'm more just uh, saying it might be too meta or in poor taste to refer to it as clickbaity uh, in public. Oh, well maybe, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're trying to, to get the job done and help people, you know? Sure. And it, it's not like, you know, there, there's there's clickbait that's bad where they click on it, they read it and they just get mad or whatever. And then there's your article where it's like they click on it, they read it and they're probably like, oh, OK, yeah, this is cool. You know, sure. I mean, I hope people got something out of it. I, I think uh, a little bit of it is some level one stuff, but I think there are like two parts of the two parts of the article that are stuff that would be really hard to fry, frame an entire article around. And I don't think people would click on it. So sinking 10 plus hours into that one is a really tough sell for me. Yeah. I mean, did you read Paulo's heuristics article? Oh no, don't do this in public. No. <laughs> okay. Well, it was, <laughs> it was like some, some level one ish type of stuff, but I also think that like framing it in those sorts of ways is, is pretty helpful too. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you can just say like, oh, you know, this isn't going to be helpful for a lot of people, but I do think that there's also just a lot of people who, like I said, kind of need that refresher or when you frame it a certain way, it becomes a lot easier for people to just kind of like interpret and start to utilize through that when you actually like lay it out for them and have them think about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are a lot of the best articles, just like the level one heuristic stuff, because I largely think that a lot of a lot of the people who are reading magic articles are people who are kind of on the level where that is very valuable to them, right? I did my job for two, three years was just coaching people in magic on Skype or discord or whatever. And there's just a ton, a ton of people who just 
need to know about land sequencing or what order you're supposed to cast your cantrips or don't attack a 3-3 three, three into a pair of 2-2s two, and that kind of thing where you need a lot of people just need a little boost in establishing combat math heuristics and the like. Yeah, the, the sequencing thing is something that I almost certainly take for granted a lot of the time when, you know, like writing articles about maybe like a complicated legacy deck or whatever where I just sort of take for granted that everyone knows that stuff. Or if they're reading it and interested in legacy, for example, that they should already get it. But, you know, the the, the more I interact with, like, the, the player base at large, it's just like, no, I mean, a, a lot of this stuff, especially if it hasn't been brought up in, like, the last five years, I mean, there's a lot of new players coming into the game and stuff. They're not going to necessarily dig through the archives and try and find these articles, right? So... That's why I think that even if it's just like a small portion of the article dedicated to sequencing for like a specific deck, it's like if, if that's important, then I, I try and get it in there. But it's tough. I, I think a lot of this too speaks to the idea of knowing your purpose in writing. Like it is fine to have the purpose of I'm trying to teach the newcomers, the new arena players who have come during this really – a period of epic growth for magic. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it on our end because we, we've lost a lot of the things that kind of defined our magic experiences with a dramatic shift in organized play. But in terms of just raw numbers of people playing the game, I think it's very safe to assume that it's higher than it's ever been. I, and, I just see the same loud people on Twitter. So it's, it's hard for me to imagine that there are new people, you know? <laughs> right, right. I understand that. Uh, most metrics point to the fact there are new people, though. And I, I think thinking about how you're serving those people is completely acceptable. I also think one of the things that gets underappreciated as article creators is how much our job is to be the filtration system for some folks. Like... The article series I'm writing now has been really interesting because it started as just something like I wanted to do. And I kind of thought uh, Cedric might say no to it, quite frankly. And I just wanted to look at interesting decks from the SCG Online events. And then I got into it and I started thinking about the goals for the piece. And it's like, well, I actually think this is extremely valuable, even if it is more cookie cutter and simplistic. And like, I, I know what I'm going to do every week. But I think I'm still giving a lot to my audience in that I'm doing all the work of reading through every single deck list that gets published in a week and highlighting the good ones for them. So they get to skip that step and like saving people's time as a content creator, that's super valuable. Like just letting them skip steps and get to the quote unquote fun part of magic has a lot of value to your readers. Yeah. So, and I think also it just like serves the tournament series well to be like, there is this platform for you. If you have something cool to bring to the tournament, you're going to get recognized for it. And someone's going to highlight your deck building work. And I think that stuff matters a bunch too. So what seemed on its face to be a very simple article series and for me almost felt like a cop out because it is easy for me to write and I enjoy writing it. And sometimes it's not easy for me to write my article and I don't enjoy doing it. Um, so when it's easy, it, it feels like cheating somewhat, but I, I think it has found a really important niche and it's cool that you can do that with content that is a little bit cookie cutter. I mean, I think that's something that recognizing what your job is or what your role is in content creation is something that a, a lot of people try to cover too many bases rather than actually just right. really excelling at their position. I know in um, Brian, we've had the uh, opportunity to cast together earlier this year, somehow 10 years ago. Yeah, um, decades ago. Right. But something that I'll tend to do with every person I ever cast with is try to get like a meal the night before or something and be like, hey, so let's talk about what our approach to this is. How are we going to actually try and in how are we engaging with players? What are we doing to what are we highlighting from players or what are we trying to bring to an audience? What do we really want to make sure people who walk out of the feature match are going to get if they if they go back and watch the tape, do we want, how, how good do we want them to feel or bad? Do we want them to feel because we have a lot of control over that as casters 
So let's make sure to try and build them up because we want people who come to our events or come and play and stuff to feel like they're doing something cool or something that they feel proud to show their friends. Or if they go, hey, I'm going to be on the SCG tour broadcast. I'm going to link it on Facebook. We don't want their you know, brother who might know nothing about magic to see us just go, wow, can you believe they missed that trigger? No, that's just not what you're supposed to do as a caster, you know? Yeah. You have to think about who you're serving and there's a lot of folks you're serving when you're doing the casting role, but I think it's just as true when you're any form of content creation. I like Jerry and I talk a lot about who are we doing this for? Like, what is the purpose of this episode? Why are we doing this episode now? When should we do this episode? All that stuff crosses our head on a week to week basis. And it's all designed to be like, let's give our listeners the most we can and make sure we're, we're hitting the right spots at the right time. Yeah. And that's something where, you know, I dove into casting a bit a second there, but it really does just ripple throughout all forms of content creation or really just like how you engage with the world at large. Right. I know we put things into boxes, like we compartmentalize all of this stuff as content that is being created and the people who make it are the content creators. But in general, it comes down to what it is you're actually trying to do, like what your goals are as a content creator or consumer in either direction. Yeah, when when I started, and this is mostly with, you know, starting writing in SCG where I started to actually take it seriously. I think the thing that I wanted to do most, even if I didn't know it or, you know, couldn't admit it or whatever, was to just prove how smart I was. And that made my content obviously really shitty. Uh, like there was information in it, but it was certainly like, presented in a way that probably made a lot of people feel stupid. No one cares and, about level 13 or whatever. Yeah, exactly. What well, I mean, it was also just like, look, if you're reading this and you don't already understand it, then, you know, Get I can't out. help you. Yeah. The doors over there. Yeah. <laughs> so as amusing as that was for, you know, 26 year old me or whatever, now I, I just want to provide value to our audience, you know, and especially when this podcast is, predicated on like the support of our patrons and everything. It's like, well, we want to give the most that we possibly can to those people. And I think that that's a lot of the reason why we've been successful, you know, like for a long time, even, I mean, this is like tangentially related to content creation, but like whenever someone would send me like a Facebook message or a Twitter DM or whatever, I would try and answer it. You know, it's like they, they always had some question about, you know, what deck they're playing or how to sideboard or something. And like, I, really did start to shift into that role of trying to provide value to the community. And that just made people want to, you know, like support us here because we continually try and do that. And it's, it's never about like what tournaments we're playing in, for example, it's always about what tournaments our listeners are playing in. And I think that that's a thing that a lot of content creators miss. Yeah. I, that's something that's why I actually liked coaching so much in general is it felt like, Every, I always would end my coaching pitch whenever someone would ask what it's about. I would always just say something to the effect of, think of it as a personalized article where the entire article is about whatever you want it to be. Yeah. No, that, that's that's perfect. I like every, it's just, I, I can't, all, all the different times that someone has messaged me and gone, you know, oh, I, I played your deck and I won FNM for the first time or in a couple of cases someone's like hey thanks so much for this I actually ended up winning my RPTQ or something or just like over the moon and I I think so much content in general doesn't I don't know that's kind of negging the content that's not what I want to do but I, I think it is important that content in general provides something that is actionable or that actually relates to its audience or tries to relate to an audience. Cause it, I mean, obviously nothing is going to appeal to everybody, but it's kind of important that it, it relates or appeals to somebody, right? You need yeah. a target. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, Brian and I, like you said, we, we talk about it a lot. We think about it a lot. It is definitely like, yeah, we're going to sit down and talk about salt or whatever, but we are doing it with the goal of helping the community at large, you know, or at least providing them with information that is relevant to them. And I think a lot of people 
just kind of like, you know, sit down, hammer out some words, whatever they're thinking about. And I think that that's fine. I mean, I, I did that crap for like 10 years. I understand how people do that. You know, the, maybe you don't have necessarily like a long-term vision for it and that's, that's fine. But at, at some point it definitely benefits you to try and figure that out. Yeah. One of my, this is whatever. One of my favorite things that magic content has done in the last decade is kind of moved away from the old school tournament reports. Those are the things that were fun and campy back in the day, but whenever you go back and read them today, a lot of times it was kind of just, Round four, my opponent bricked on their lands, and I very cleverly curved 3-0, 6-1 yeah. in games. And it's just yeah. like, what What am I supposed to What am I supposed to get out of that, you know? Very self-serving. I think people enjoy a good story, and there were some people who were very good at it. And I think people trying to, like, chase that led to there being way too many of them. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there's a lot where, um, was it Cunningham? That was just like unbelievable as far as being able to just weave stuff into the stories. Yep. yep. Yeah. <laughs> like, obviously, they're, I, I'm, I'm not trying to poo-poo everybody who's ever done it or anything, but there was a point where it's just like, look, I don't, I don't need to know what you got for breakfast before the IQ. That's just not what I'm here for. Yeah, I mean, it's it's good if you can actually tell a good story and if all the stuff is relevant or whatever. But yeah, a lot of the time it is just like Dear Diary and I don't really care for that. Yeah, and I'm sure there are people it appeals to. It's just, I don't know. I, I think a lot of it just kind of circles back around to who is this for and is like, are you just trying to build a fan base that is a fan of you and all the actions that you take? Or are you trying to build a base that is into learning from learning the things that you have to teach. So one thing that has bothered me recently is trying to watch Twitch streams and just having everyone be like very overwhelmingly negative. I don't know if, if that bothers y'all as much as it bothers me, but like I said, I was very negative when I started writing and I think I have mostly turned that around. I like try and be positive and I think that's just beneficial, but like the Twitch stream stuff really bothers me and I find myself like not being able to watch a lot of people for like more than 10 minutes. Is that is that normal? I mean, earlier I alluded to liking uh, Amazonian stream more than most just because as, as far as entertainment value goes and a lot of it is that she just like goofs off. And even when something goes bad, she just goes, God, our opponent has got to be singing right now. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, this is, this is, this is feel good. This is, I, I feel nice about choosing to consume this content. I like, God, I love everything she does. <laughs> I, I don't want to, I don't want to shell too hard. I'll have to like invoice her or something. <laughs> nah, p- please do. Please do. Like, I don't know. I, I feel, I feel like, you know, pretty boomery, like making these complaints, especially since it's like the, the people that I'm watching are like the the people with the most viewers or whatever, right? It's like, clearly people are enjoying this. So I don't know, maybe I'm going about, about it all wrong. But yeah, I, I recently, or like somewhat recently, you know, within the last 10 years or whatever, tried to be more positive about things, be more upbeat because, I don't know, you don't want to read an article and just be like drugged down and depressed at the end of it, right? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But clearly there are people out there who love it. Well, the unfortunate reality, I think, in all forms of media is that negativity sells really well. Like news media, obviously, like fostering anger is a huge, huge thing in news media now. And, you know, Jerry, we can go back to our decision basically to abandon the YouTube platform. I, I won't share the specifics of it, but basically we were in a hotel room looking over what was doing well on YouTube and disgusted by the content that was like raising to the top. And don't take that as like a blanket. If you're a YouTuber, there's good YouTubers out there. I don't mean to just disparage everyone, but certainly some of the things that were getting large number of views, they just weren't good content and they were built on negativity and being edgy. And it, it was just such a frustrating space. And part of it is like, we are older and, Fine. I, I can accept that. I, I don't really 
care. And when I was younger, I probably liked the negative stuff and liked trying to be edgy about it. But I agree with you that at this stage of my life, it's not what I'm looking for, especially when I'm trying to be entertained. It's not entertaining to me to see someone be down and cranky and negative about things. And I don't know, maybe it's unfair to like ask someone to be up all the time. And I get it. These are hard times. It's it's difficult to always be on. But at the same time, if you are looking to make content, I think you should regard negativity as the easy way out because it does sell and you can build an audience with it. But ultimately, it's impact on your happiness, on your viewers' happiness. Like, is it positive? Maybe. Maybe you're able to make some inroads, but I, I just think you could get so much further if you're able to build a platform on lifting others up, lifting yourself up. And I think, Emma, it's, it's great that you're here for this discussion because you've done such a good job of that. And when I, when I think of your brand and your platform, I always think of it as elevating other people and trying to just generally make the space more positive for everyone involved. So you certainly deserve kudos for that. Appreciate that. I think a lot of it in general is just, I mean, maybe this is, see, now that the, now that the play design gig is out of the bag, it feels like this is going to come across as bootlicky. But one of the things that has constantly frustrated me, especially in the last year or two, is the immediate approach for so many people to go to like the, God, all the all the play designers are, are so stupid about, you know, how did Uro get through, how did OnMath get through, etc. When like, instead of the approach being like, wow, that job must be hard, or whatever. There are just so many people who, in general, I feel want to feel justified in feeling negative. They want a reason to feel like, you know, I, I can be angry or I can be upset. I mean, there's a laundry list of reasons that I imagine the the point you alluded to, Brian, about negativity selling in the news industry. Like, there's got to be a reason for that, right? And it's not like, you, it's not like the magic community is different. We're still people, ultimately, or we like, we are still a demographic of people. And so at least with my own content I, or my own place in the community, I've largely tried to not be that just in general. I just don't think it is a healthy way to live. Like I don't, I don't think the people who try and foster that kind of emotion in general, or I don't, I don't think they're whatever they're getting out of it. I don't think it's positive. I, I think that's the the best way to put it. Yep. I, I agree with you. And to, to your point, I just think like, again, it's easy to just make those pot shot complaints. It's harder to make a thoughtful, nuanced complaint and actually consider all the factors involved and understand the complications of it. And I, I don't think it's bootlicky. I think it's like more in tune with reality that it is a challenging job and things are not always going to go right, which is why I, I think my more recent approach has been to focus on how to better adapt to things going wrong. I think that's more of the discussion that's useful to have right now because things are just going to go wrong. And like uh, making sure the game can survive things going wrong is an extremely, extremely important thing. So a lot of my approach hasn't been like, oh, laugh at play design for making Uro. It's figure out ways to cushion play design's mistakes and think about ban policy and how that can be adapted and just a more cohesive approach to problems than just being like this problem sucks and you know the game is dying maybe some of that creeps into my mind but i'd rather try and look at it proactively and be like what can we do about this problem yeah i i think there's this tendency for people to go oh well if you want to complain about this how about you offer a solution that isn't realistic right because then you have a bunch of underinformed or undereducated people trying to just pitch things that they might not have all the information about, but there has got to be a lot of space under that to just yeah. say like, Hey, you don't necessarily have to commit your life to preventing Oko's from coming out, but there is a world where you can probably, I obviously am not going to say for sure, but there's likely something that you can do to make yourself feel better or make other people feel less negative whenever those accidents inevitably do happen. Right. Yeah, it's it's funny to me because they 
they jump to the conclusion of, oh, these people must be stupid or whatever, when clearly that's just not the case, right? Oh, yeah, my, my super tongue-in-cheek thing is to ask which person they think is stupid. <laughs> so like, I like Which that. one of them? Yeah. Whose fault do you think this is? And then it's like you look at the list of names, and it's just like, oh, yeah, I know all these people. I know that they're all, you know, like really smart, good at magic, whatever. And then you're just like, okay, so then what What do you think the, the real problem is? The answer is it's complicated. You right. know, it's, it's a hard job. They're probably understaffed. There are a lot of outside mitigating factors. Cards change all the time. You have to take things into consideration with context too. And yeah, the, the, the solution of, oh, they're just all really dumb is very clearly not true. Yep. What about social media for you, Emma? Because I think you have a very unique social media presence. What's you know, that like, supposed to mean, Jerry? Uh, I, I think, <laughs> I think that you are very stern, but in a good way. In a good way. Like, you're, you're stern but spouting facts. You're no bullshit. Sure, sure. I mean, for the most part, I just try to... I don't even know. I don't know what to say to that. Uh, <laughs> or is, is this about... Is this still about magic? Uh, content creation and, uh, like, influencer type of stuff. Sure. Right? Like... Whenever, whenever you make a tweet, it's like speaking to like you and your brand and your personality and all that good stuff, right? So, I don't know. Sure, I think for the most part, a lot of a lot of the things that I do are ultimately just me trying to either arrive at the right answer or help other people arrive at the right answer. Right? I don't necessarily. I'm not super invested in starting it correct. But I would like for collectively for people as a group to end up there. And I like to think most of the stuff that I choose to put into the world is informed enough to be in the realm of correct. Uh, that's not always the case. That's why I, you know, I before a second ago I asked about if this was still about magic. I know I use my platform to uh, uplift a ton of voices on social issues and the like. Um, specifically people who are far more informed than me because I just don't think I can speak on a lot of these issues because it's either just stuff I haven't experienced or something I'm not actually a part of. But when, when it comes to magic in particular, a lot of the time I think that I have made it to where I am in not just competitive sp spheres, but content creation or casting or the size of the platform I hold as a result of being correct often enough that I can have a little bit of confidence behind the things that I say. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you think that my, my characterization is, is fair? Like I, I did not mean it as a neg in any way. Oh, I mean, I think I lean aggro a little bit too much on Twitter. I think I am really bad at reading tone a lot of the time and tend to take things more negatively than I should. So that leads to me being a lot more of a hard ass than is probably uh, appropriate at times. I, I mean, I feel like if, if you're engaging with people on Twitter more often than not, you know, people are coming at you hard. So it's, it's completely reasonable to just assume that that's where most people are. You know, if it's, if it's not entirely clear. That's right. So I, I think that's sort of a mix of a, or my response to that is a mix of a couple of things you've said. One, about trying to be more positive and uh, responding to messages because those are like living, breathing people on the other side of the screen, right? And there's also a point where I like to think that the brand I have cultivated and my, uh, my liberal use of the block feature has uh, largely yeah. cultivated an audience of people who are engaging in good faith. So I, I think I have some lived experiences that lead me to assume people are not engaging in good faith a lot of the time. But the last year or so, I have been pleasantly surprised and simultaneously disappointed in myself at how frequently I have just gone in guns blazing on people who just didn't know something. Oh, word. It's like, okay, well, yeah, I understand that this person might think that, you know, pronouns or some racial issue or something is not actually a problem, but 
you know, who actually doesn't know that. And then it turns out this person actually yeah. doesn't know that. And yeah, you found the person and yeah, they're just and like asking a question. They were just like, yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, I really thought you just are kind of nice most of the time and just thought that you could help me out. But, uh, uh, instead, and I don't know, I, I think that's something that I've been trying to work on, but still have a ways to go. No, that's legit. I mean, like I said, I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I do think that it sets you apart. And I do think that you are right, a, you know, a vast percentage of the time. So I don't know. It's like your your Twitter feed makes me happy. I appreciate that. But as, as far as like your, your platform, you know, like outside of magic content creation, like I, I think it is important with, you know, what people choose to do with it, right? Like you, you were talking about, basically like spreading information and helping people to get to the right answer, even if it's not just like directly listening to you or whatever. And I think that, you know, uplifting other people's voices who are more knowledgeable on it, or maybe people are more likely to listen to or something like that. I mean, that, that is part of your brand and your personality. And I think that that should tie into how people see you as a content creator. So I think it's, it is important to show that side of yourself if, if you're able to. Yeah, absolutely. I have uh, I have some fairly strong feelings on people's <sighs> obligation is like kind of an ugly word, but I think it's the closest one I have to it to try and, you know, leave the world better than they found it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's, again, one, one of those things that I've only started to do within like the last five years or so, right? So it, what it's a hard. Dink. <laughs> <laughs> what a dink. Why is that a, a quinky dink? Oh, I also, I, I was reprehensible about seven years ago. Okay. No, fair. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's hard for me to look at, you know, people who are not doing that and judging them or whatever when I was I was in the same boat not that long ago, you know, and I don't know, I, I still find myself doing it, but like I try and take a step back and realize that, you know, give them a couple of years and see what happens. Yeah, giving people room to grow is really important. Well, uh, speaking of your lovely Twitter presence, there was a card that was previewed from Call Time. You want to talk about this? Oh, we're doing we're doing actual magic, like hard hitting Magic: The Gathering content on the Arena Decklist podcast. I suppose I, last couple of weeks we've kind of been shifting away from Magic a little bit, and people seem to be enjoying it. So I don't know, maybe there's a future there. But Damn, I suppose I guess we can read are just some cool people. Yeah, maybe. Uh, or people have bad taste. One of the, one of the two. Well, that's not a way to be positive. <laughs> well, it's like it's bad taste in in the best possible way, you know. Like I'm positive, you should be kinder to yourself. Uh, this might be one of the times you're wrong, though. Ever think about that? <laughs> Uh, Such no, a high I've, percentage. I've actually you never thought that in my life. <laughs> Have you seen my Twitter? <laughs> so this this card got previewed, and uh, I'll I'll read it in a second. But the background is that it, it just seemed like a lot of people were like, "Oh, this this thing stinks." And then Emma, as she does, sort of like dropped the truth bomb on Twitter, and I loved it. It was great. Uh, so the card is. Showdown of the Scalds, 2R dub, Enchantment Saga, Chapter 1. Exile the top four cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may play those cards. Chapter 2 and 3 are the same. Whenever you cast a spell this turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. So before you made this post, what what types of things were you seeing people say about this card? So the big thing I saw was basically that it either was hard to actually cast all of the spells meaningfully or... Uh, chapter, it was hard to make use of chapter two and three a lot of the time. Like, how many creatures do you actually want to have in play if you're playing this grindy card? Or if it's like a top end rebuild sort of card, how many creatures are you going to have available if you are rebuilding? And if you aren't rebuilding, then why don't you just like Ember Cleave them or do something that presses your advantage instead of something that helps you grow the proverbial snowball? So your tweet was, yeah, people negging on this card when, number one, it's an effect more unique to its colors. Number two, the closest analog is currently banned in standard, meaning Escape to the Wilds. Number three, this card is way more abusable. Okay. And <laughs> the, sa- the sassy okay at the end is obviously what sells me. 
<laughs> Look, I, I, it's, it has to be a tweet at the end of the day, right? That's true. Yeah, you can't, you can't just be like writing an article. No one wants to see that. Look, they so, didn't give us 280 characters to, so we could just use 140. That's true. The things that you're describing are all people basically looking at this card and just being like, you know, if everything stood the same and this card was legal and standard, like would I play this instead of Ember Cleave instead of my creature deck or whatever? It's like there's so much more context to be explored here, right? Like not only is there a set full of new cards, but you get to try and build new decks with this card, not just slot it into existing homes, right? Like also this has a unique effect. So maybe you should try and do something different with it rather than just like slotting it into Boros or something, right? Yeah, this is something that it... Whenever you see a two-color card, the the question should not just be, how do I fit it in the two-color deck? It is, how do I fit this in any deck that has at least these two colors? So you just end up in a lot of spots where... Mardu Yorion is a deck that has felt pretty close for basically since Omnath got banned. I know yeah. it's something that I almost played at the first Rivals split because it was something that felt like it could beat up on Selesnya Yorion. And this card would be unbelievable in that shell. Yeah, and you're mostly just taking advantage of the first part also, which is another thing that people just seem to overlook. It's like they want to get the most out of the card possible when the chapter one and the other chapters don't really seem to go that well together, but I'm pretty sure they do. Right. I I, I think, sorry, Emma, go ahead. No, I was just going to say there are so many situations where there is a card that randomly has some sort of trinket text on it that doesn't, even matter and you just do the other stuff on the card and that's fine you know back in original innistrad for example bloodline keeper vampire token maker would show up in blue black control decks sideboards and main decks mostly for the mirror and it had this effect where you could transform it and it grew all of your vampires whenever you did but if you reached that point you were already kind of winning anyway so who cares But no one was complaining, like, I don't have enough vampires in my deck to utilize this card. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if if you if you just removed chapter two and chapter three, and it was just this enchantment that stuck around for three turns, you would probably find some way to use it, but it's just like the other text that tricks you. Yeah, and so many we have so many mold drifters in standard right now. Right, we have so many spells that have a creature attached to them, specifically because of the adventure mechanic, that having incidental creatures lying around is hard to avoid, right? Even control decks are playing Shark Typhoon. Right, or, you know, have random castles or, you know, Nissa lands or whatever. There's there's so many different ways to potentially take advantage of this. Even if you're Urianing it, it just means that like, okay, well now your Urian beats their Urian in combat. Yeah. That, that is exactly what I was going to point to is that I, I'm willing to go a step further than y'all. Uh, not only does it not matter if the trinket text was good, I think the trinket text is really good on this card. I, I think that effect matters a bunch because you're so likely to be able to leverage it on a turn, specifically with like the Urian setups, like playing this card, blinking it with Urian, your next turn should be fairly tremendous and sizing on Urian is so important. Like if you've, if you've used Elspeth Conquer's death to bring back a Urian, you understand the value of that plus one, plus one counter on your Urian. It, it really matters a bunch to say nothing of the fa- fact that we often build Urian decks in such a way that there's just other stuff around. There's plan of war visionaries or uh, omen of the sun tokens or some nonsense that can benefit from getting pumped up a little bit. But that only speaks to the Urian side of this card when you think about it in just a super low to the ground red white deck where this is just your refill. This is this is your four cards and all of your cards cost one or two. So you're going to cast all of them on your turn and you're going to buff your board on top of it. That sounds really strong to me. And Emma, you mentioned one particular white aggressive card in our pre-show and I'll, I'll hand it back to you to talk about it because I think that was an excellent point as well. Was it the adventure one? 
it was the adventure one. Yeah, so we we talked a little bit about the the parallel between this card and Escape to the Wilds before and how that card was so strong in adventure, specifically because ultimately you want the cards you draw to be powerful, but if they're powerful, they're probably going to cost more mana, which means you probably can't cast all of them in one turn cycle. And one of the mechanics that helps break that paradigm is just the adventure mechanic because you get to cast the cheap part with everything except like Fey of Wishes or whatever, where you cast some one or two mana thing and then you get to put your creature in exile and you don't lose it forever. The card Shepherd of the Flock is something that plays to that perfectly. It's a two mana three one and the adventure portion of it is just one white instant bounce a permanent you control. That is all it does. But... That means that you can just bounce your showdown of the Scalds if you hit it off of your the first chapter of Showdown. Or if you just draw your copies of Shepherd of the Flock early on, you can just cast a 3-1, and it just is a 3-1 that can attack. It is so incredible with this card. I mean, the, one of the things about Showdown is it also just makes combat impossible the turn after you untap with it. Imagine that card flipping over... Let's say Shepherd of the Flock and a Bone Crusher Giant and two lands. And Good then luck. your opponent attacks with two or three, or then you attack with two or three creatures the following turn. All of a sudden, you have two plus one counters to distribute, as well as two damage to put on something. And that's if you have nothing else. Yeah, it, it's almost unfair that all of us are so high in this card because no one's here to take the opposite position. But I don't know how you take the opposite position on this card. I, I just think it looks incredible, incredibly strong would be very surprised if this ends up being a total miss in the format. Obviously we need more context and it will always change as more of the set gets revealed, but in just terms of raw rate, in terms of where this fits in with existing cards, in terms of where it fits in with just archetypes that could theoretically exist, like will a red, white low to the ground aggressive deck be good enough? It hasn't been for a little while, but there's tools floating around and I could very easily see this being an important part of the format going forward. Yeah, it feels like these decks are getting a lot of new tools in general. And this card, I mean, think of it this way. If your Chandra Torch of Defiance gives you four cards you can play, you are so happy with that, right? Correct. And, and that's in addition to the fact that this has the pump attached to it as well. And this is obviously ignoring the fact that Escape to the Wilds lets you play an extra land. So if you hit, say, three lands off your Escape to the Wilds, then... You know, that was fine, but it's pretty rough if it happens with Showdown of the Scalds. But that still is just clearing a bunch of cards out of the way. And the plus one counters don't just come from the cards you play from Exile. Yep, any spell you play and it it lasts whether this is removed or not. So you could you can bounce it back and then get a counter for replaying this card. That sounds pre- kind of sweet, right? Imagine yeah, hitting yeah. Doom Foretold. Yeah, sounds pretty good to me. Sorry, I've been thinking about this card all day. <laughs> no, it's, it, I, I understand why. The The thing about this card is that if it doesn't hit, I don't think it's the card's fault. It's it's like the product of the stuff that exists around it. Yep. But even, you know, like Urian exists, right? So like that is going to be in a deck at some point, regardless. But like as far as whether or not we have, you know, some Boros beatdown deck or three color beatdown deck or whatever, I mean... That that might not necessarily be up to this card. It might be a product of whether or not like those decks are just good in general or have enough tools. Right. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't know how how you can look at this and just be like, oh, it's, it's it's a bad magic card. And I think a lot of people need to widen their scope as far as uh, how they approach card evaluation and start looking outside of you know just what exists right now. Yeah, in general, I I had a really bad tendency for, God, the first, until about two years ago, I'd say, I had a really bad tendency to just, I I was very eager to write cards off because I was super, I liked being comfortable with what I knew and mastering the best ways to use the game pieces I was familiar with rather than figuring out how to incorporate the new ones. And in the last year or two, especially, it, it it kind of blows me away how frequently people go, oh, fire design philosophies kind of outclassed the previous things before it because all they've brought the floor up, they've made the average card more powerful, etc. But then are also pretty quick to write a card off without ever having played with it as if like, 
all of these cards aren't designed with those same philosophies. <laughs> right. Like you, you complain about how every card is busted and then a new card gets previewed and you're like, oh, this is probably bad. It's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that I, when I left Wizards, I started coming at card evaluation with fresh eyes. And I think that I've sort of gained back some of my bad habits over time. Uh, so, like, I, I definitely fall under the camp of, you know, people that I'm criticizing right now, and I need to be better about this now. I mean, like, look at any of our top 10 shows, right? And we, we just missed the mark on over half the cards. So, it's a thing that we can all do better, for sure. Anything else y'all want to add before we get into question time? Uh, I will just say, Emma, I'm very sad that you're leaving this side of things, but I'm also really happy to know that you'll be working on the game. I think you're going to do a lot of good at Wizards of the Coast. I, I can't imagine someone better uh, for the job. Your insight into the game has shown through in everything you've created. And uh, my my only gripe with you going to Wizards is that I don't think we'll get to ever cast a show together again. Well, at least while you're there, you never know what happens in the future. So we we'll keep our fingers crossed that someday we're able to cross paths again in the booth. Look, I can I can stay optimistic that maybe ha- something happens on the Watsy side of things. Who knows? Absolutely. Never Obligatory know disclaimer that I am not speaking for Wizard of the Coast, and I have no <laughs> hidden information from Wizard of the Coast Hasbro. See, or any this, of their other associated this is going to bring down our broadcast, Emma, when you're constantly <laughs> dropping these disclaimers. It's just not going to flow as nicely. Look, I... I almost, uh, we were talking and there was this thread about talking about favorite moments of the year. That top four match we covered in Richmond mm. was, I, yeah. I, I still tell people about it. Like, no, that was an excellent match for honestly, sure. like the kind of stuff we like stood up from the table and we're just like, do you feel that? Did you, it was that, or like, look at this, my, the hair on my arms is standing up. This is incredible. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it stands out to me as one of the best matches of the year too. And I, I think like, you know, certainly we, we, I think we do have good chemistry together, but when you're working with someone new in the booth, it just takes time. It takes time to like really get the timing right and understand the flow. And we had been working that weekend and I think we were finding our footing and it felt like in that moment, it really clicked and we worked off each other really well. And we also got an incredible game to go with it. And I think all those things combined to have one of the more memorable matches of the year for me, for sure. Yeah, I, I think in general, magic casting is something that's a lot harder than most people think it is. And like getting into that flow state is something that's so hard. I, I can only think of like four or five matches I've ever done it in what, like two years of casting or something now. And right. like, that was one of them that I just think about all the time. And it was incredible. So I hope, I hope this isn't, uh, we, we haven't hit, we haven't come to the end of the line of possibilities here. I hope so too. You know what? Actually, real quick, I'll pick your brain on something. What has been your impression of casting Arena now that you've done it a few times? Obviously, your background is the same as mine. You started with casting paper events. How how are you impacted by the shift to Arena? It was really hard at first because when one of the <laughs> one of the most important skills as a caster that no one talks about is filling. Just mm-hmm. in general, like, okay, you know, we got the match going, we're gonna we're going to have things ready in a minute, but we need y'all to make 90 seconds go by or what have you. That came up in matches a lot just because someone would fetch. And then all like, especially in legacy, you would have someone go, okay, turn one tank, bloodstained mire tank, start fetching. And then you just have to eat 30 seconds to a minute while they get out their volcanic Island and shuffle and cut. And then they cast a ponder and they look at their three cards for 30 seconds and then they shuffle and you have to fill for right. a minute and so yep. on. That just isn't the case with arena. And because so much of it is automated as well, the, the, the actual gameplay is just so much faster and actually catching all of it is so, so hard. I, I, I think it is harder for both the play by play person as well as the analyst, just because Play-by-play is a lot to cover, and the computer moves everything so much faster than you can dictate all of it. And I, honestly, the way that uh, Cedric was able to transition to it pretty seamlessly was part of the thing that cemented me just thinking he's the best to do it. Especially as an analyst, it, it completely threw off my rhythm of understanding, okay, 
I have to talk about the decision that they're making for about X amount of time. You know, you feel it out with different players and learn. You do not have that much time to explain why a play is being made on Arena. A lot of times you have to go, okay, so they're bringing the Croaks back here because it's the best use of their mana and just rush the ending part yep. instead of explaining the other things they could have done. And then you just go, and they discarded this card because next turn they want to try and draw a two drop and hope that it works out. Yeah, I, I was not expecting how dramatic the shift was. I've often talked about how, as the play-by-play person, I feel like a lot of my job mirrors, say, a baseball play-by-play caster or a golf play-by-play caster where you're just supposed to create a tone and an atmosphere and a not leisurely but comfortable pace, like where you just get a flow going and represent the rhythm of the game really well. But play-by-play for arena is like hockey play-by-play. And sorry for all the sports references if you're not a sports fan, but it it is just like snap, snap, snap. This is happening. This is happening. This is happening. And there's no time whatsoever to really get into that flow. So it's challenging. It's totally different. It's exciting. It's fun. But also like when there is absolute certainty that – arena is the future of the game and coverage particularly i have to push back a little bit because i I don't think it's as simple as just like the information being presented clearly there is value in like that flow that pace that comfort and there's a reason people still watch baseball and golf in an age where there's more high-paced exciting sports there's there's comfort to it and i i think paper magic will always have its place because of those type of factors for sure yeah, I don't, I don't think, I mean, you know, quarantine aside, I don't think that Paper Magic is going anywhere, as far as I'm aware, at least. But um, I don't know. I, I think that it is a different ball game more than it is a lack of a ball game when it comes to finding that flow state or even adjusting the dynamics of a of, of your tone relative to the game state and what's going on. I know there's a lot of little things that can be done that I, I'm not trying to go too deep into, you know, technique TM here since this is a side tangent in its own right. But I don't know. I've, I've always been a pretty big proponent of um, just using things like the rate at which you talk or the pitch of your voice, the volume, et cetera, to kind of, I don't know, you, you say how exciting something is without telling people how exciting it is. You know what I mean? And I, I think right. there's a lot to be said about that whenever it's just like, as goofy as this is, even just letting card animations kind of tell you when something exciting is happening. And it's just, Mm -hmm. I I, I think the actual signs that you're reading are different enough from, from tabletop magic that I, I I think it is like, I I think it's incredibly daunting, but I don't think it is completely devoid of that. No, I think that's a fair point. Look, I could talk about this for literal hours. I think it's fascinating. But oh, same. Uh, we'll stop. We'll stop subjecting <laughs> our viewers to this thing that only probably a few of them care about. Although that's kind of our mo recently. If you could sit through twenty minutes of alien talk, you can listen to us talk about magic coverage for ten minutes. Oh god, I forgot we even. I forgot we even did that. <laughs> I just, I just kind of went to bed, and it was like that never happened, and like not a lot of people said anything, so that was good. <laughs> Oh, aliens have been a, a hot topic of discussion on my timeline all week. So. Oh, great. I'm glad. Maybe we should send him over to Cedric next time. Uh, yeah, he's he's about fed up with us. So if you have any I thoughts about how I fed up it. Cedric is, you should probably reach out to him at Cedric A. Phillips on Twitter and let him know why it is so important that he continues to field all of these questions for us and doing that good work he does as a support member of the Arena Deckless staff. Is, we have is a total dangerous. bit. He DM'd me about it, and I was like, oh, yeah, tell the world how mad you are. Tell the world, because that'll make them do it more. And he was like, God, thank you, Emma. I really wanted more people to interact with me about this, and you've given me the key. See? I knew I, I knew we were doing Textbook. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't know. I'm getting kind of scared, because he's he's getting cl- pretty close to breaking, and I don't I don't <laughs> want him to reach that point, you know? Yeah, he. I guess he is our boss. It's probably not best to inflame him at all points in the day. Although, since Emma, you are leaving, I feel like there's a lot of room for you to take over the mantle here. Exactly. See, you get it, it's a rough spot, right? He's my boss for like exactly two more weeks. 
Right. Uh, but at the end of that two weeks, I move a lot closer to him. True. So Very who true. knows what could happen? <laughs> Look, as as someone who lived in Renton when you know Cedric was in Seattle, I saw him like once a year. So I think you're safe. It'll be fine. I, I have seen Cedric's apartment more than I've seen Cedric in Seattle. Because I've been to his house to put away his groceries several times when he gets them delivered. But I don't think I've ever <laughs> actually seen Cedric when we were in Seattle. Man, I'm I feel bad like asking someone to watch my cats. I, w- I don't think I would ever ask someone to put away my groceries. Oh no, Cedric's like, yeah, I got a cooler of groceries sitting on my uh, front step and I'm in whatever, Ohio right now. <laughs> Can you go take care of that for me? That's just weird. I don't know. I've I've definitely dropped off several like decks of cards to him. He's just like, I want to borrow this for the weekend. I like drove it up there. He wasn't there. I snuck into his place and left it on his counter multiple yeah. times. Yeah, I, no, I put everything away. I sort out his fridge for him. Sometimes I'll do the dishes while I'm there if I'm feeling real oh, generous. Oh, come on, come know, on. Clean up the place a little bit. Fold his uh, towels into a swan on his bed. And <laughs> <then I'll leave. laughs> All right, uh, question time, Emma. I solicited the good folks in our Discord for their Emma-related questions. And I didn't get a lot, but I specifically asked for good ones. So I think that's fine. Yeah, I and, think so. And you you had one that you wanted to do. Uh, so I'm just going to read this, and you can take it away. Sure. Uh, question, question comes from Everest. What insight... Can you give into coaching? What's the best way to approach it? And what can someone expect to get out of it? So this is something where I ironically have done a few coaching sessions on coaching, where it was people who were looking at, who wanted to try coaching for the first time or had been approached about it and talked to them. And I, I, there are a couple parts of uh, of this question that are a little nebulous. So I'll try to cover as much as possible in a short amount of time as possible. Um Touched on it a little bit earlier where uh, the end of my pitch usually was whatever you want a magic article to be about, this is your hour to get whatever article you want. I, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make is that they will go into coaching thinking that it is basically a one-on-one stream and we'll just go, all right, well, let's uh, let's play some games together, I guess, and then just kind of tell the person what the right decisions are and then they'll play a league or something and then that's that. Generally speaking, whenever I work with someone with coaching, a lot of what I try to do is try to actually establish good heuristics for learning about the game and learning things for yourself for the say in, in the way of say figuring out how to know what you don't know that you don't know. Something, for example, uh, whenever I'll do gameplay with somebody, I will generally have myself drive whatever so they can't just click through things and i'll just go okay what would you do here and they'll answer the question i'll say okay what aren't you doing here like what what are your other decision lines and why aren't we doing them and a lot of people you can learn a lot about the level that they're actually thinking about the game on by figuring out how many different lines they actually see and what cards they're choosing not to play around what cards they're choosing to play around how efficiently they're trying to use their mana, if they think mana efficiency is something that matters in a matchup, and so on. There's a lot of it that kind of just comes down to actually opening somebody's mind up to all the different times you are actually making a decision within a game or a match of magic, up to and including what cards you put in your deck or don't put in your deck, because not having a card in your deck is a decision in and of its own right. That might just sound like a bunch of word soup that doesn't amount to a ton, but I think a lot of it does just come down to getting somebody to recognize all of those various decision points. And that way, even if they choose not to work with me again, which is totally understandable, there are plenty of people who have just done one of sessions and there are some people who did a bunch of them, whatever. They, they have the ability to at least get something from it, even if they never play the deck that they wanted to learn about. As far as ex- something to expect to, or what someone can expect to get out of it, I think that's going to depend on what someone's actually trying to get coached on. Part of part of the deal, at least with me, was I had about six or seven different kinds of coaching sessions that somebody could want. Right? Some people do just want the gameplay, and they just want 
to go through things with you. Some people want to learn how to sideboard with a deck. Um, I have a, I don't know if other people sideboard the way that I do, but I have a very, um, what's the word for your step-by-step? Mojo is not the word. A very set in stone approach. Like meticulous. That is, meticulous is a, a good word for it. A very meticulous approach to sideboarding that I generally would try to teach people that kind of works as a learning tool for how to actually frame cards during the sideboarding process. Uh, sometimes it also is, a, I'll playfully berate people for being a chicken and just wanting to trim a bunch of cards instead of actually <laughs> putting the work into finding out what, like when people say, good cards in, bad cards out, you know, you actually need to find out what the bad cards are, right? So not putting the work into not thinking about it is just kind of lazy. And if you want to get better at the game, you need to figure out what the bad cards are and you need to figure out what the good cards are. But I like to think that if you are someone who is looking for a coach, uh, if you are upfront about what you actually want to get out of the coaching session, I think that that would go a long way in finding somebody who is good for you at coaching, right? I think there are a lot of folks who might want to work with somebody who is their favorite player or something like that, but might not actually be the best person to teach them a specific archetype or something like that. Or if you just want to learn about a specific archetype, look for somebody who is good at it, right? I, um, I worked with, uh, I coached uh, Joe Lissette a couple of times, uh, even though at the time he was, markedly better than I am. And that's fine. Like dude's obviously incredible at magic. Um, this was shortly after he won the players championship and everything. Uh, but he wanted to learn modern storm and didn't know anything about it. And I had written a couple of primers on it, updated the deck a few times, done well at a few classics and so on. And he just wanted to learn about storm. So he approached me about learning storm and that's what he got out of the session. And I think that recognizing what somebody can teach you and what you want to learn, trying to make those two things line up is the most important thing that you can do whenever you are actually, if you reach the point where you're interested in finding a magic coach. Yeah, that's, that's really smart on his part because I I don't think a lot of people in his position, especially like coming off a a big tournament win, right. would be like, Oh, I need coaching, you know? Yeah. I, I, it's something I was kind of blown away at the time, but I, I mean, One of the things, and actually the point that earlier I talked about my article this week having the Queen's Gambit title, the the section of it that I don't think I could get a whole article out of is how to learn from people that are worse at magic than you. And I think that that's just an incredibly valuable skill because in general, you can learn something from basically everybody. So even if you view somebody as better or worse than you, you can find the thing that they are better at than you are and try to learn something from them. Right. I mean, we've, we've all had different experiences playing magic and you know, like not that Matt Nass is bad or anything, but like he's the combo guy. Right. And there are like a lot of good limited players and every team wants someone who can like fill a, a, a niche. And because like Matt Nass has played more games with combo and he's probably learned a bunch of like weird stuff that you haven't come up against yet because you've only played a little bit, kind of like Joe was said in that situation, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there. I've been lucky enough in a few times for a couple of um, PTs now to just have the ability to work with people who are far, far better at, at the game than I am, but I was still able to contribute things to the team because there are things I had put time into that they had not put time into, and therefore they did not have to put the same kind of time into it because they had access to me as a resource. Exactly. So are, are you familiar with our stance on coaching? Hit me. Basically, you know, a lot of the folks that were selling coaching was basically kind of what you were talking about before where, you know, someone would play a, a league or whatever and the other person would watch and tell them what to do. And neither Brian nor I think that that is very helpful. So when a lot of people inquired for like us to do coaching, and I mean, not a lot, but some, whatever we would just tell them no, because like we, we didn't know a good way to do it. And what you have laid out sounds like a very, very good way to do it. Yeah. I, uh, I, I don't actually know if it's still available. The, the methodology for sideboarding, I think is the, the biggest thing that was a, uh, a, a really, really helpful tool for, for a lot of players. 
because it also just forces you to actually think about cards within the context of a matchup and gives you those sort of building blocks to take with you. And I, I, I think that's something I, I might have it available. I don't think it's available as an article, but I might have it as a video. Let me actually check that really quick. I did a stream where I broke down. I, I played a PTQ, an online PTQ that I made the finals of with a deck I'd never played before. And then the next day I streamed all of the matches and the sideboarding plans. No, it looks like I didn't. All right, well, anyway, it's possible I could maybe end up having that be an article or something before I, I go off to, to Watsy Jail, as it were. But <laughs> uh, that's something that if anyone is looking for coaching, or if y'all were looking to get into coaching, I would be happy to to tell y'all about. I think a couple of years ago I could have done it. I certainly can't do it in 2020. Maybe not in 2021. We'll see. My biggest concern has always been that I don't know that I would be worth the money I would charge, which like sounds silly because it's like, well, idiot, don't charge that much. Not at all. Um, and, and I see what you're saying, but I, I just think like if I'm going to give up the time, then I'm going to do it because I believe I can have a meaningful impact. And I'm going to price my time as I see my time worth, which is like pretty high. I put a pretty high value on my time. Now, granted, a lot of that time is spent doing nonsense, but I value my nonsense a lot. So that's the determination I've made. I'm willing to live with it. And I've, I've never felt like I can give people enough for what I would charge. And I'm just not comfortable doing that. But maybe there's a world where like I could come up with a good enough set of tactics and maybe you could coach me on coaching to get to the point where I would do it someday. But much like Jerry, n- nothing good is coming for me for the rest of 2020, certainly. And I hope by 2021, I'm able to contribute positively um, and actual have actually have meaningful social interactions and be a real human. But yeah, none of this is me trying to be like, hey, so if y'all want to want to hang out later, maybe talk about maybe get some coaching about coaching, you know. Well, I know I, to- I'm the one that brought it up. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> not not accusing you of trying to sell anything. I'm just saying uh, I I like that you've kind of like cracked the code on how to do it. And you certainly went against the mold of what everyone else was doing. I honestly just don't think I was good enough to do what other people were doing. Not even in a bad way. Like I'm not trying to be self-depreciative or anything. I don't think I was actually that great a player until about a year ago. Sure. But I actually no, cared about winning. Like I just cared way more about learning about decks and learning how to write and learning how to cast and all this other stuff that you kind of had to go to the events to learn about. But uh, I don't think I really was that invested into my results until August or so of last year. So it would have been a really tough sell to. It would have been a really hard, tough sell to be like, okay, so you're going to you're gonna do everything I do in a game of Magic, and that's just all you're going to get out of this. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it, if, if, if you're telling me that you only cared about results up until a year ago and, like, this is the year that you had, I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive what you can do when you put your mind to it. I like to think that uh, quarantine just eliminated a ton of distractions. That's interesting. But, that's but that's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean – what like whatever it takes right yeah i mean sort of i don't i can't say i would push the button that made it happen you know (laughs) i appreciate that thank you (laughs) i wasn't about to blame everything on you but you know (laughs) whatever it takes right emma well well, whatever it takes no no i just i just meant like you know you're you're in the situation and you you took advantage of it and that is good Right, I'm not saying you push the button. Sure, sure, sure. I appreciate it. I would, I would be less impressed and more terrified if you did push the button. <laughs> uh, you know, not. I, I love magic, but this is this is not a very big payoff for that button. You know, yeah, it's going going a little far for a few <laughs> extra games of magic. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, on that note, any interest in signing us out? Oh God, does that mean that I just have to say that's game? Yeah, or whatever. I don't care. It's your show. That's how... Okay, first of all, no. But uh, second of all, that's game!
Good luck. <laughs>